This is the lecture for Roy Sorensen's article, Permission to Cheat, and both topics in this lecture come up in this one line on the top of page 208, so we'll read this line. The politics student says, What Professor Dedlock meant to say was that the students were permitted to, quote, cheat, end quote. That is, to engage in activities that are normally or formerly banned. Scare quotes turn a normative term into a descriptive term. So this gives us two things to talk about. First, uh, the idea of scare quotes, and second, uh, the idea of normativity and normative terms. So first, scare quotes. So scare quotes are quotation marks around the word, not to indicate that it's a quotation of something, but to indicate sort of, hey, pay attention, like something weird is going on with this word. In this case, uh, the politics student is talking about how scare quotes apply to the word cheat. Uh, then the literature student gives another example, where, uh, which is about uh, standard and substandard performance, and then Professor Dedlock says, no, 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 blah, blah, blah. So you'll see all that when you read the article. Here, uh, I just want to talk about scare quotes in a separate context, just because this is an interesting topic in philosophy, and it's something that philosophers call the use-mention distinction, or the use-slash-mention distinction, just to be clear. So when we have words, we can use words, or we can mention words, and there's a big distinction between those. So here are two things I can say, or two things I can write. Uh, imagine I'm just talking out loud right now. So if I talk out loud and I say Ashoka is a six-letter word, and then I say Ashoka is a university, it sounds like I've just contradicted myself. How can something be a six-letter word and also a university? That's uh, what, <laughs> it's, it's one or the other. But no, of course what I've said makes sense. In the first case, I was talking about the word Ashoka. I was talking, you know, that is a six-letter word. In the second case, I was talking about what the word Ashoka sort of refers to. It refers to the university, and that is a university. So in the first case, I was merely mentioning the word Ashoka. I wasn't actually using the word to mean Ashoka. I was just mentioning, here is a word, Ashoka, and let me say something about it. It's a six-letter word. In the second case, I was using the word. I was, when I said Ashoka, I was using it to refer to the university. So most of the time when we say words, we are using words. So the second case is much more common. So the word is, the word a, the word university, the word is, the word a, the word six letter, the word word, all of those are words I'm using. The only word that gets mentioned in those two sentences is the word Ashoka up here. And we make this clear when I write this out, I put little quotes around Ashoka. See, I put scare quotes, so now you can sort of tell the difference when it's written out. And see, it says like, oh, of course, Ashoka is a six letter word, and of course Ashoka is a university. So when we speak, it's hard to sort of make a distinction between use of a word and mention of a word. In writing, in philosophy, it's much easier. We put quotes, scare quotes around the word, or we do some other sort of formatting thing to say, look, I'm just mentioning the word. I'm not actually using the word. So that's an interesting uh, topic. It comes up a lot in uh, philosophy of language. What is it to actually use a word as distinct from mentioning a word? You can imagine cases where this could be important. So uh, take, for instance, slurs or other offensive words. Is there a difference between using them and mentioning them? And what is that difference? Is merely mentioning a slur as offensive as using a slur? If I sort of write down a slur uh, to sort of talk about it, but not in order to use it, is that OK? Or is that just as bad? Or is it bad, but not as bad? Um, and all sorts of things sort of can be built on this question of the use mentioned distinction. So I bring this up just because, you know, here's a place where we use scare quotes and it's an interesting thing in philosophy. So that's the first point. The second point, getting a little more directly into the article, but still not very much, we have this idea of a normative term. So we've seen normativity before in the lecture for Carroll. So uh, there we talked about normativity and the normativity of logic. And I noted how there are other kinds of normativity too, like morality and aesthetics. And here in this article, uh, normativity is being contrasted with descriptive or descriptivity, I guess. Um, 
And what is descriptive? So descriptive is just not normative. So what was normative? Well, to refresh your memory, you could, I guess, watch the old lecture. It's because it's online, but no, uh, we'll talk a bit. Uh, normativity is about uh, what is uh, better or worse, good or bad, bot. Should normativity, broadly speaking, it's about like judging things, judging the world. So judging something as more logical or less logical is better or worse according to the standards of logic, according to the standards of morality, according to the standards of aesthetics, something like that. So we use normative statements to talk about like what you should do or what you should believe or what you should think or things like this, or what it would be good to think or what it would be bad to think, right and wrong and good and bad and stuff. And then descriptive is everything else. So when we say something is 75 degrees Celsius, uh, that's not a normative term. We're not saying it's better than something that's 65 degrees or worse or something. Uh, we're just saying it's different. Uh, and so that's a descriptive term. Lots of things are descriptive terms. So like color terms are descriptive terms, weight, height, like, you know, age, all these things. Lots of things are descriptive terms. Lots of things are also normative terms. So if I say something is good or bad, or I sort of judge it according to some standard, that's normative. If you really start to think about this hard, it gets kind of fuzzy. So sometimes uh, when we say, like, let's say you admire tall people. If you admire tall people, then calling somebody tall, is that saying that they're good in some sense? Is that a normative term or is that a descriptive term? I don't know, it gets kind of fuzzy. So there's a lot of debate in philosophy about what exactly is normativity and what makes it different than descriptive stuff. Some philosophers say, no, there is no normativity, it's all descriptive. Others say, no, nothing's descriptive, it's all normative. And then there have been various people who draw the lines in certain places. Uh, but this is just to sort of get you back into thinking about normativity and descriptivity. And you always want to keep these things in mind because although Sorensen is pointing out that he's using the word normative and descriptive here, so he's being clear about this, uh, this is sort of in the background of philosophy all the time. And so you do want to be clear about who is making descriptive judgments and who is making descriptive claims and who is making normative judgments and normative claims. And we mix these two together all the time. So just as much as possible, try to be clear about whether you're making a normative claim or a descriptive claim, both tied together somehow, uh, because just sort of knowing what you're doing and knowing like whether you intend to be doing a certain thing, uh, it's just good to be clear about what's going on in your head so that you can understand what it is you're trying to communicate and uh, maybe think about whether it makes sense that uh, a certain claim ought to be normative or descriptive. So when we talk about moral questions, for instance, Eventually, you have to have some sort of normative claim in there if you want to convince somebody of a moral argument, because moral terms are normative terms. So if you're merely making descriptive claims, then probably something is missing somewhere. And then similarly for science, we often think that science is merely descriptive, whether or not it is. Uh, sorry, I'm recording these lectures out of order. At some point, we'll have talked about this. Oh, no, it's our next reading. So yeah, Intamon is going to talk about uh, whether science is entirely descriptive or partially normative. But if science is entirely descriptive, then you want to make sure, as a scientist, you're not making any normative claims, and so on. Uh, but uh, again, just sort of have these distinctions in the back of your mind and uh, think about them as we go through the course.